How much should I pay for this hurricane damage catamaran? And how do you go about buying a hurricane damage boat? All this and more in this episode. I'm not exactly an expert on this, but this is the 12th sailboat I've owned and I've owned even more power boats. But I've bought a grand total of one hurricane damage boat. Um, but I'll go through my understanding of the process and how I understand uh, it works and it, I think your mileage might vary because you know every, the, every situation is a little bit different uh, when buying a boat. So my boat, I found it on Craigslist. It was posted by the friend of the owner of a salvage company in the Bahamas. Um, so after the uh, hurricane comes in, there's a lot of salvage companies that come in. Uh, and so, in, in my case, this was one that was actually local to the Bahamas. The salvage companies come in and salvage the boats. And so at that point, you have a couple options to purchase the boat. You can buy it directly from the owner. Now, if the owner is um, doesn't have insurance, for example, the, the, they'll and they want to get rid of the boat, they'll sell it to you. And, and usually they have to pay for the pay for the salvage, etc. Uh, the, the insurance company, if the boat was insured, the insurance company then takes possession of the boat and they have to pay for the, the salvage uh, to get it salvaged. And then the, you can buy it directly from the salvage company because a lot of times they'll get it from the insurance company and some of that happens through auctions. And then finally, it can end up in the hands of a broker or an auction company and a lot of those will get auctioned off. And so the further along in the process that you go, of course, the more you're going to pay for it and the more steps that have been involved in it. When they go to salvage the boat, it can cost a lot of money. They've got to uh, bring in cranes and, and barges and dive and flow bags. And, and because, you know, all the boats are piled on top of mine. There's another boat, I believe, upside down on top of it. And so you imagine that's pretty expensive uh, just to get the boats out of there. And then uh, mine, for example, they patched up and got floating again and then put back in the water. And in some cases, the salvage company might want to fix up the boat or clean it up to get it ready, and other times they just want to get rid of it. So really, the state of the boat when you buy it makes a big difference on the price. Uh, after the hurricane, the boats were really messy. I mean, my, my boat, when I bought it, had so much junk. It had timbers from docks or whatever embedded into the boat. And just things were, were quite a disaster. A lot of the other boats I looked at, they had already started cleaning them up from different companies. Uh, they'd clean them up and they looked pretty nice. But as you go and look at the boat, uh, you'll find all sorts of hidden damage. And so I would say my number one recommendation is it's a must. You have to go look at the boat in person. And so uh, when I went down there, I went and looked at two different boats. I mean, that was that was my goal is to, uh, to look at these two different boats and decide which one I wanted. Um, while I was down there, I was able to hook up and look at a bunch more boats. And as I looked at the different boats, those ones, the, 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 all the other ones were more cleaned up. They looked nicer, some newer boats. But then as I went to look at them, even though they were clean and the interior looked great and I'd have hardly anything to do in there, there was tons of structural damage. The keels were broken off, rudders broken off, tons of delamination around the sides. One of the other things to consider is timing. How long has it been since the hurricane happened. When I went and looked at this boat, I think it was about three or four months after the hurricane. And so what happens is it depends on how much of the stuff, like if it wait, if you wait too long, some of the boats that don't have as much structural damage will get uh, picked off and, and they won't be available and you'll end up with slim pickings. And also one of the bigger things is uh, there's a lot of theft that happens. And so that these boats are salvaged and people will go there and strip it and things like that. And so you, you really got to take a look at well, did you get there soon enough to get it? Well, well, there's a lot of the stuff still intact on it. What did they strip and what, what was there and what's not there? Um, and so I think that's also important. And that's also important of the timing from the time that you buy the boat till you get the boat or get the boat in a secure location. Because if it's not in a safe place, uh, people will strip it down there, especially after a hurricane, because there, there's these all these salvers and they're going around and just picking stuff off of boats, whatever they can find. Another thing you have to think about is location. Uh, where is the boat at? Um, so it's not just where it's at, but how are you going to get it to a place where you can work on it? Like I say, where the first place it was, there wasn't even water or power at that uh, at that location that I could get, and uh, nor a place to stay. I mean, we were driving in the in the car so close to after the hurricane, all the windows were busted up and they were taped up with with duct tape. And yeah, anyways, it was it was pretty rough out there. And I, it went into the store, and and they were limited on you know go to this grocery store, and it's pretty much all empty shelves and a couple bottles of water and a couple things. And I'm paying like twelve bucks for a little uh, box of of crackers because it was so close after the hurricane you just couldn't get stuff 
Um, so you have to you have to plan on that. And like I say, that was a lot, a lot of my expense was getting it to where I'm working on it because it, it, with that distance, trying to work on it from a distance is going to cost. If, if, if you can't go and live there for six months or a year, depending on uh, what, what, your, what your time frame is to get the boat fixed, um, then it's going to be difficult. Because keep in mind, you know, there's the three-legged stool. You can have either low cost, speed, or quality. You can have two, but you can't have three. And so generally, I'm going to go for low cost and uh, quality. And so for me, I wanted to get it close enough um, to my house that I can work on it. So where it's at now, I think it's about 15, 20 minutes away from my house. I can work on it. 24 7 so i can go there late at night after work and work on it or work on it in the evenings um all night i don't have to worry about noise originally i wanted to put it in my yard because i have a pretty big backyard but we're in a town and i don't think that would work really well and and then it, it was going to be tough getting it in because it was even hard to get the the, the truck was so big so uh, in the end we i ended up putting it in an industrial park and that worked out um a lot better and it's it's so i paid more for the haul out and, and it's pretty expensive versus say a travel lift haul out but a boat yard can get really expensive especially when you want to be there for a year and so the the nearest boat yard for, for me up in cape canaveral that had a wide enough lift because a lot most of the places around don't have a wide enough lift uh travel lift they had a wide enough lift i called them up and i said can i have three months and they said no you can't have three months they want maybe a week maybe two weeks but you can't have three months out they, they want to keep the turnover for for keeping the the, the money going and so it with that that was sort of my challenge is finding a place because i wanted it on the hard where i can just work on it uh so make sure you have a good plan of okay where are you going to work on it make sure it's close to where you're living and that you're not going back and forth because that can really cause a problem another problem you have to think about is insurance a lot of places don't want to insure a boat that's in that condition and so i have good luck in the past with with like progressive they'll ins i've had boats insured and they'll do it with no survey and things like that uh, but they won't, they, they won't do it with a boat that big. And so my problem was because the boat was too big. Uh, it was really difficult and it is difficult to get insurance in its condition. Um, so you got to think about that too. And a lot of places won't haul you without insurance. So this boat here is a boat that I bought uh, while I was in Hawaii and I bought it with a partner. Um, and this is this isn't a prime example of someone that doesn't know what they're getting into. And so he he thought this was going to be a starter boat and he was going to cruise the world. And so uh, I think the second time he went out on the boat, we were doing a night crossing from Oahu to Maui. And it gets pretty rough in Hawaii. I mean, it's some of the roughest. You've got 2,000 miles of fetch where the waves and the wind are building. And then it hits those channels and it funnels in between there and, and the waves just stand up. And so you've got some big waves. And so we're out there at night just pounding through this. And um, yeah, anyways, he's like, oh, I'm an ex-Navy guy. I don't get seasick, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was the first one tossing his cookies in the sink. And so I, I think a few months later, uh, I ended up buying him out. And um, it was really funny. I mean, he, it cost him some money to, to buy the partnership because we had some expenses and um, et cetera. But uh, his wife was so thankful to me. She, she came up and she's like, I'm so thankful to you. I'm like, why? He's like, well, he used to always talk about cruising the world, but after that trip, he never says nothing. So <laughs> it, you just got to make sure, you know, that it's cut out, that you're cut out for it. And, and, and the best way to do it is get out there. So if you haven't spent some time out there, get some friends that got a, that have a boat or go charter a boat, uh, take some bare boat classes. That's, that's really some of the best ways. And just, just get out there. I'm a software developer for a living right and and so you don't really have to have a certain skill set to do this but you need to be a project guy so all my life i've been a project guy from the first sailboat that i um that i built myself i think when i was 12 or 13 uh to, to this other one which uh, i got some funny stories about that it didn't exactly hold water but it made it downwind it wouldn't go upwind and uh, my brother is still mad at me for making him bail for hours uh but <laughs> but uh but the second sailboat i fixed up and I, i've owned a lot of boats throughout the years but you don't necessarily need just boating experience because there's boaters and there's non-boaters and it's only after you've owned a boat or two that you really find out are you in the boater category or the non-boater category but what what you really need it is to be a project person because buying a boat like this this isn't the best way to get a cheap boat right this is this is going to be a major project and if, if you're not used to doing major projects like that if you don't love working on boats it's just not going to work out it, you're going to get stuck on stuff and you're, you're going to it's going to get hard but you don't necessarily need a background in it right you just need the drive 
And so I've done lots of projects like this. Uh, some people have a bucket list. I think I have a barrel list. So one of the things I did, uh, um, I decided I needed to build a house, design and build a house. So my wife and I, we designed a house and then I built it. I built it myself. I, I dug the hole. I poured the concrete, framed it, roofed it, sided it, uh, did, did all the stuff. It took me two and a half years while I worked full time. So you can do stuff as long as you have that drive to do projects like that. And, and so just get out there and do it. If you have the dream, then you can do it. But you know, you might not want to start as big, right? So even, even myself, I started small. Uh, I have a video here of a, of a model sailboat that I built uh, because I was thinking about designing my own catamaran and building one from scratch before I bought this boat. And who knows, maybe I'll still do that. It's still on my bucket list. But, uh, but it's, it's just having some small projects and getting those projects done and, and going through a few will help you get started before you take on a, a really large project. And, and the cost of the boat is both exponential based off of its length. And so it's a lot of times it's better to start with a smaller boat. I had a couple comments that someone should have paid me to take the boat or that uh, I should have got the boat for free. And well, yeah, that's true. You can get a free boat, especially here in Florida. There are boats all over the place that have that have run up against the, sh the shore that you can get. But the thing that you need to take a look at is how much will that boat be worth when you're done? And a lot of people can't tell the difference in price between, or the value of a boat when the two boats are in, in both in the salvage state, right? So a, a quick look at Yacht World on this boat shows it, it, its value fixed up. Now this is a boat identical to mine. It's a year older, but it's had a hundred and twenty thousand dollar refit, and they want just over five hundred thousand for it. So, and I think that's a pretty good deal for the boat. It's a, it's a very solid boat, and they've 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 done a lot of work to it. Uh, will mine be worth that? No. There's always a stigma um, behind a hurricane damaged boat, even though the title isn't. Um, isn't marked in any way like a car would be but there's always something about it and i of course wouldn't hide the damage that's not my style when i sell the boat if i sell the boat which isn't my plan but if i, I was i would fully disclose uh everything that i did to it uh so but but the boat certainly you can see there's going to be some value in this boat a lot of times you look at some of the other boats and what's the what's the price of that boat fixed up Twenty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand. Uh, it doesn't make sense, and and so you're gonna you're gonna put close to the same amount of money in that boat as I'm gonna put in this boat, and so that's really the big difference. And so you really need to pick a boat that that will actually have some value, or that would be very valuable when you when you're done with it. Otherwise, it's really not worth it because it's gonna cost a lot, and we're gonna cover that in just a minute. So what did I pay for my boat? I paid fourteen thousand dollars, which I think is a, pretty much on the low end for a hurricane damaged catamaran. Um, but part of the thing that factors into that is it wasn't cleaned up, right? It was a total disaster when I bought it. And if you don't underestimate how much work it is to clean up, if you watch episode two, you'll see how I spent a week. And I mean, it was like 12 hour days for a week cleaning this thing up. And, and I just barely scratched the surface. I got, I got a lot of the stuff out, but I didn't even get it cleaned up. It's still got a lot of work to do. So a lot of the hurricane damage boats that I've seen go more in the thirty to eighty thousand dollar price range. And like I say, I'm not an expert. I haven't seen them all, and and I think it varies. I think you can get them less than that. I think you can get them more. Uh, if if they're they're in pretty good shape, a pretty new boat that just has some dings and needs a new rig, I've seen them, you know, two three hundred thousand. So th there's a huge price range of of what you can get. It, it a lot of it depends on how much work you want to put into the boat and and what you've got there. But then keep in mind that's the initial price. But then let's look at uh, what it takes to get that boat from where it is to where you can start working on it. So what I have in the boat, so I have about um, three trips to the Bahamas. Uh, first one to look at it, then one to clean it up and one to start on the engine. Then it would have been one more trip to the Bahamas and I would have been able to drive it back. But that because of COVID that didn't work out. So it was three trips to the Bahamas. They cost me about a thousand dollars each and I went I went bottom line, low cost, right? Super primitive. I stayed on that boat or I stayed on another boat while I was there uh, in the salvage yard. And, and yeah, it, it's got some crazy stories about the, the living conditions there and, and what we had to do. And, you know, fortunately the one cabin is actually in pretty good shape that I haven't really shown that much. It doesn't really need anything other than a little cleanup. So I stayed in that on an air mattress. And, and so 
so so so initially there's some some costs but if if you need a hotel and you need that stuff man you got to figure 2000 at least uh per trip uh so i've got those three trips then the first tow getting it from marsh harbor which had no power no way to work on the boat so that first tow was then thirty five hundred dollars um to where it was and then the the next tow because i couldn't get back there to work on the end the, the engines to, to drive it back the next tow was additional three thousand so keep in mind i got sixty five hundred in it now then i've got another uh fifteen hundred um let me look at the the the, the price here i've got another fifteen hundred into engine parts about 2,000 more in a bunch of boat parts, uh, a lot of which got stolen. Uh, and then there was about 2,100 for the crane, 1,500 for the hull. And um, so, so that's about 13,000 additional, 13,500 additional on top of the original purchase price. So I basically doubled the price just to get it to where it is now without doing anything other than the engine work. Uh, and, and so then I'm gonna figure, uh, an, a year of storage, maybe a year and a half of storage plus back to the water, that's gonna be another seven grand. Uh, so that adds up before you even start adding up the price of the boat, uh, the cost of the boat. And so you'll find the initial cost of the boat. You know, it's important not to pay very much because it really starts jacking things up, but uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So what is my total budget for the repairs? I think my just rough estimate is about 100,000 for the repairs. Um, I don't have a hundred thousand cash on with me, but you know I'll borrow what I need, and hopefully I can push a lot of it off uh, until the end of the project. Um, but I think it's going to go something about like this. Let me pull up my numbers here to look. So um, the hundred thousand, it'll be about five to ten thousand uh, in fiberglass supplies. Uh, you know, you look at that core cell, and I'll show you when it, when we do the episode on buying the materials, which I already have. Uh, but the core cell is like three hundred dollars a sheet. Uh, so it's not cheap, so you got to get that, and then we got triaxle cloth. I got to buy, so we'll cover all that. Um, so five to ten thousand in that. The interior parts, probably another ten thousand. The rig's going to be somewhere between ten and thirty thousand. Um, the electrical, maybe ten to thirty thousand. Mis mis miscellaneous hardware, ten to twenty thousand. If you subscribe and follow along, you'll find out because we'll do a re check back into this in maybe three months, six months, a year down the road, and see how wrong or hopefully how right I am with some of our budgets and some of the um, things that I'm saying on this. So the bottom line is this. If you love working on boats, if you love projects, and, and you can't afford the boat you want to go cruising on, this can be a great deal. Other than that, I don't know that it's that great of an investment if you're just looking for a cheap boat or you're looking for a boat to flip and, and you don't want to work on the boat yourself. Uh, you, you might have luck and you might not, but it's, it becomes a lot more dicey at that point. If you have a dream, whether it's this, whether it's a powerboat, whatever it is, I say go for it. Thank you all.